Okay, this video is on how to do correlations in JASP. Unless you're doing research without having had a stats class, or just learning statistics for fun, hey, I'm not judging, and have also never had the joyous experience of sitting through a stats or research lecture, you probably are already familiar with correlations. However, in case you aren't, I'm going to start off with a quick rundown on what correlations are. If you are wanting to just watch how to do things in JASP, just skip ahead to around the 6 minute and 35 second mark. So what is a correlation? A correlation is just like it sounds, a correlation between two things. Or a relationship between two things is another way to put it. For instance, as I'm making this, I'm in the happy time of year between Thanksgiving and Christmas where there's a new party every single week, and a fresh excuse to stuff my face every single day. In fact, for me, there appears to be a positive correlation between December and weight gain. In fact, the idea that eating extra over the holidays might lead to weight gain doesn't sound strange at all. Neither does receiving a higher electric bill during a heat wave in August when air conditioners are running full blast nor an increase of student caffeine consumption during finals week. But on um, all of these, we can't forget the golden rule. Correlation does not imply causation. December doesn't make people gain weight. When I put it in context of holidays and food, it probably made sense, even if you haven't personally experienced it. That's the tricky thing about correlations. It's easy to get ahead of ourselves and start thinking about causation. We don't even know that it's the holiday food that does it. It could be less physical activity due to poor weather, decreased metabolism because of things in a branch of science I don't study, a combination, or maybe something else entirely. So don't fall for it. So how do we measure correlation? We use something called a correlation coefficient. A correlation coefficient, first off, is fun to say. Second, it makes the relationships between items quantifiable, or, in other words, gives a standardized number to express how related two things are, so you can better interpret the relationship. There are three things you should know about correlation coefficients. First, they can be positive or negative. Second, they always fall between a negative one and positive one. Lastly, the sign doesn't matter when you're talking about strength, only how far away from zero it is. But don't think for a moment that the sign doesn't matter at all. It does. If it has a negative side, it is a negative correlation, and your correlation line will go down. In other words, as one variable increases, the other one decreases, or vice versa. As one goes down, the other one will go up. If it's positive, your line will go up, or, in other words, as one variable goes up, the other will also go up, or increase. If your correlation is around zero, your line will be, well, flat. In these scatter plots, each dot represents a data point. Imagine the first one being a bunch of tasks I have to do. I prefer the term energy efficient over lazy, but whatever works. Now, the vertical axis, the y-axis, represents my relative motivation to complete each task. The horizontal, or x-axis, represents how much effort each task takes. If you look, you can see a negative correlation indicating that as the amount of effort goes up, my motivation goes down. In the next figure, you see effort is replaced with coffee. Presumably, someone's attempt to bribe me and to do stuff. I'm indifferent to coffee, so the line is flat, and there is no correlation. In the last uh, scatter plot, though, someone has thought to bribe me with chocolate. That is a good motivator for me. So as the amount of chocolate goes up, so it is my motivation. So it is a positive correlation. So that we don't start thinking causation instead of correlation again, let's flip these around. Maybe. As my motivation goes up, I put more effort into the tasks, and it's not actually the tasks that specify how much effort they require at all. Maybe I just put more into it. Or maybe 
as uh, my motivation increases, I eat a lot more chocolate just because I'm generally more happy or feeling like doing something, like eating chocolate. Because there are multiple different interpretations, you never want to make assumptions about correlations. These plots are, of course, just randomly selected and not related to the examples. That is why there isn't a stronger correlation. By that I mean, if there was a stronger correlation, the dots would be less spread out. If, for every unit of increase for motivation, I consumed one more piece of chocolate, that would be an exact perfect correlation, and all of the dots on the chart would end up in a straight line. A strong correlation, on the other hand, will still resemble a line, it just won't be a perfect line. It will be a little bit more spread out, a little bit more like a fuzzy caterpillar, for instance. The ones that I have here are relatively weak. The positive and negative ones uh, are really, really, really spread out. You can kind of see a direction, but without the line, it's harder to tell. Numerically, 0.5 or negative 0.5, or, or anything closer to 1 on either side, is considered large. 0.3 or negative 0.3 is considered medium, and 0.1 or negative 0.1 are considered small. Okay, now that that is out of the way, let's see about actually calculating some correlations using the program JASP. If you're watching this, you probably already know what it is. But, just in case you don't, it's a free statistics program. On their website, they describe it as a low-fat version of SPSS, and a more delicious version of R. That may sound funny, but if you're familiar with the other two, you'll have to agree. It's less complicated than SPSS, but a lot more user-friendly than R. It may not have as many options, but it still has a lot, and is simple to use. Let's go ahead and open it up and get started on some correlations. The first thing we'll want to do is get the data we'll be working with loaded. JASP conveniently comes with five data sets included, so that we can practice. I'm going to use the first one on the list about the Big Five personality type system. As you can see, it says, a nice correlation data set, made just for this example. As you can see here, we have five variables to work with, all of which are scale data. Note, you will have to have already done all of your data cleaning elsewhere before starting this. Your next step will be to click on the regression button and then on correlation matrix. First, we need to decide what we are wanting to compare. If you want to select all of the variables, you would simply click at the bottom of the list and drag upward. If you just want a couple, however, you can either double click on them, drag and drop, or click on one and hit the arrow in the middle. If you want to put one back where it was, all you have to do is reverse it either by dragging and dropping, or by clicking on the button, the little arrow. For some reason, double-clicking on it uh, doesn't do anything whenever you're sending it back. For this example, I honestly don't know what might be correlated with what, so I'm just going to select them all and see what I get. As you can see, we have our results appearing on the right-hand side. These tables are already APA-ready, which is very convenient. So what does this all mean? Looking at the table, you'll see that it says uh, Pearson correlations at the top of the table, and then Pearson's R repeatedly in a column. That is referring to the most commonly used correlation coefficient. Pearson's R is a coefficient for linear data, or to put it another way, R measures the strength of a linear relationship between two variables. I'll get back to the linear thing in a minute, but first let's talk about this table. On the top and left side, you have each variable listed, and each number on the table represents the correlation between the two. For instance, this here is the correlation between neuroticism and openness. The lines represent the variable's correlation to themselves, which is, of course, 1, because it's the same thing. Each variable pair has two numbers. 
The top one is the correlation, and the bottom one is significance. The significance is represented by the letter P. As you see over here, it says the p-value. The p that you're looking for is going to be less than 0.05. The smaller the p-value is, the better your results. On your correlations, though, you're looking for numbers as far away from zero as possible in either direction. Since they can only go to positive or negative one, it could also be phrased that you're looking for a number as close to positive or negative one as possible. Some of them are positive and some of them are negative, indicating that we have both positive and negative relationships here. Looking at the table, it looks like our largest correlation is conscientiousness and neuroticism at a negative at 0.368. It's a negative correlation, so as one of them goes up, the other one goes down. If you remember, a correlation of uh, 0.3 to 0.5 is considered a medium strength correlation. If you want to make it easier to spot the correlations, you can check the little box that says flag significant correlations over here on the left. You will now see little asterisks decorating the table. As you can see down here, one asterisk denotes that p less than 0.05, 2 means p less than 0.01, and 3 means p less than 0 0.001. Beneath that check mark, uh, you have uh, one for confidence intervals. The number that you had on the chart is just from your sample and may not truly represent the correlation between those in the population. This confidence interval means that in 95% of the samples that you might have, the true correlation is going to be between these two numbers. Next up, we have the option of making some scatter plots to represent these numbers. To do that, all you have to do is select a correlation matrix, and it will automatically appear, appear below the correlation table. Now we have all of these lovely scatter plots to represent each and every relationship between the variables. You can also select to show the densities for the variables uh, in case you want to see how normally distributed your data is. Most of these look pretty normally distributed with a little bit of funkiness going on occasionally, but still very normally distributed. Lastly, if you want to just show your statistics in this particular figure, you can also click Statistics and it'll show you your correlation and the confidence interval. If I can get it to move over for me, there we go. Okay, let's go ahead and get these plots cleared off of here so that we can talk about some of the other stuff without it getting in the way. For instance, what's up with this hypothesis thing over here? Talking about one versus two tail tests is a thing for another video, but basically your p-value is the only thing that's going to change. It's going to improve or worsen depending on whether you are right or not about the direction it's going. Let's take the confidence intervals off of here so that it's not getting in the way and have a look at it. This is it when it's just regularly correlated. Take a look at the asterisks and where they're at. Then move it to uh, correlated positively. The things that were already correlated positively are still. But the things that were correlated negatively are no longer and marked as significant. Okay, you know how I said I was going to talk about that linear thing in a minute. Well, it's time. The last little section of the screen that we haven't talked about. It's already checked as Pearson, which is the automatic and the most common. It also happens to be for linear data. That is, the increasing or decreasing relationship between two variables falls on a straight line. But data isn't always linear. Sometimes it's curvilinear, and sometimes it can go from being positive to being negative. 
consider height and age, for instance.